Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear again? I'm a doctoral student from UNC SEALS, that is UNC Chapel Hill School of Information and Library Science. This is the third lesson in the short course on the basics of library and information science, LIS. Again, this is a short version of undergrad introductory class in iSchools. Here you will learn the basic terms just enough to get you started. A semester long class will discuss these topics in more detail. So, on our agenda today, information systems, classification, and information retrieval. I know, another bunch. We have already gone through a handful of histories and theories last time, and this time, we will look at how things technically work. This will fall mostly into the modernist side of information science, where we understand information as something abstract and with hierarchical structures. But as I said, taking this modern lens can help us understand modern technologies that we are still living with today. So in this lesson, we'll start a discussion with how we move from casually grouping things to systemically classifying things. Then we take a structural view of information systems and their algorithmic logics. In the end, we'll also see the scientific engineering side where people try to improve text-based search and recommendations. So maybe let's again go back to where things started, modern times. Or maybe a bit further back. Okay, that may be too much back, maybe somewhere in between. Um, so the idea of classification is not new. We as humans always need to tell that some things belong together while other things belong differently. So we know, say, these fruits are safe to eat while others will poison you, and we will need to tell the similarities and differences. This is very basic functions of our neural systems, and each of us learn to group things together from a very young age. For example, when you learn to count your fingers, you start to form the idea that these particular parts of your limbs work together as a group. These are all fingers and your toes are different, right? As we grow, we gradually form more of these general aggregated concepts. You can have many apples that are somehow equivalent to each other, and each of these apples are different from, say, uh, bananas, right? So similarly, dogs can somewhat compare to each other, but they are not cats, Water is not the same as mud. Photographs are not the same as paintings. Mexico and China are different countries. Jeans and skirts are different clothes. Women and men are different genders, and so on. Some of these differences may seem pretty obvious, while others can be quite arbitrary and only get naturalized as we gradually soak into our culture. On the good side, knowing to group things, we won't eat something wrong and die. On the bad side, we also fall into stereotypes, compartmental thoughts, and binary thinking. So it's a balancing act. During modern times, the basic need to differentiate things and people got intensified. According to Ian Hacking, a Canadian philosopher studying history and philosophy of statistical science, this change came to European countries around the 18th century. As cities and industries grew, people not only needed clearer cuts between different people and different things, but they needed to calculate each of their values, risks, costs, and outcomes in this fast-running, well-calculated industrial machine. This called for systemic classification, and as we mentioned last time, also precise documentation. These two things come hand in hand. Classification systems differ from our rough understandings of differences and groups. Our personal understandings are flexible and subjective. You don't have to agree with someone else's categories, and the categories don't have to be precise or never changing. Classification systems, on the other hand, are shared among huge groups of people. They have to stay relatively stable, and they classify things or people in a very rigid manner. This is because huge number of people have to collaborate around these systems, and they rely on clear references to different things, so they can do their works and run the society consistently. Here's an example, Library of Congress Subject Heading System. This is a standard classification system used by almost all university and research libraries in the United States. It is very well documented with detailed, strict hierarchical structures and a quite abstract numbering system. If you ever want to change the system, the revision process will take years to complete and involve groups of professional librarians and library policymakers around the table. This system it is obviously not the way you will organize your own bookshelf. Yet, it is built into almost every published book in the United States. Usually, on the copyright information page, you can find the Library of Congress Cataloging in Publication Information, or CIP, 
that is where it is. It influences where you can find certain books in the library, and whether some books are about are put together or apart. It may even influence whether a library will buy books assigned to a certain topic. As Hacking argued, in the modern times, these newly invented classification systems and statistical categories became very high stake and also very widely used. More importantly, they gradually became part of the culture, and sometimes they seem to be the only way we can understand the world and our own lives. Of course, this is not to say differences in human bodies or non-human materials did not exist until modern times, but the classification systems forced everyone to think and work in these grand pigeonhole narratives. Now you have to pick a side. Are you a man or a woman? Are you a citizen of this country or that one? Is this a fruit or a green? Is this building for commercial use or household use? Is this book a science textbook or a novel? If you can fit things into these categories, modern classification systems will give them a place in the society and keep things running. But if you don't want to be part of a bad system, for example, or if you can't fit into a particular category, it will come with high costs because now the system will start to fail you. Even now, for example, there are still debates around whether certain ingredients should be banned from food, whether certain social media platforms are public space or corporate space. Some people still believe fetuses are humans and put their rights above women who want abortion. Police violence gets by because police officers see people as threats to their lives, and patients die of medical conditions at home or even in hospital because others decided their conditions are not an emergency. Perhaps most of the times, modern classification systems work as intended, and that is why the society is not just falling apart. But the blurry, problematic, or even beautiful parts can be the difference between life and death. And we need to keep in mind that all classifications and all categories are artificial. These are boxes that exist only in our minds, and all the systems eventually rely on human labors and subjective judgments. Okay, that is again some heavy stuff. Maybe let's go with an easier engineering thought next. Okay, this is not easy at all, but let me explain how this works. This diagram comes from Michael Buckland and Christian Plant, and they were trying to draw out common logical structures behind a wide variety of information systems. To be more precise, they were trying to generalize a wide range, but also a particular kind of information-seeking activities. When we are facing huge amounts of things out there, and we need some help to find the useful ones. Information systems are the intermediate helpers in this case, and this diagram is to formalize how these systems are structured. So for example, let's think of a product catalog from retailers like Amazon or Target. Let's think of not just the website, but their entire system, from the warehouse and storefronts to the computer systems, both on the front end and on the back end, and to all the people involved buyers, sellers, store staffs, warehouse staffs, manufacturers, etc, etc. Okay? Now, this entire product cataloging system is an example of what Buckland and Plant were trying to abstract in that diagram. When we are facing thousands and thousands of products manufactured all across the globe on a daily basis, how do we get the things we need? Let's look at it part by part. So first, let's look at what Buckland and Plant called transformation. In the case of product catalogs, obviously they try to organize and present something. That is, commercial products that retailers have in stock. But the catalog itself is not the same as the actual things on the shelves. Someone needs to type in the product names, prices, etc., and turn actual products into database entries. These entries in the catalog are just signifiers. They represent the actual product, which is a signified, as I discussed in our last lesson. That is why Buckland and Plant divided these two things on this diagram. The actual products in stock are called source objects, while the catalog, the database entries that Amazon or Target has, is an internal representation of the external things. When someone enters that product stock data into the catalog, that is when transformation from source objects to internal representation happens. After that, there is also another transformation step to further pick searchable parts from the internal representations turning them into a searchable index. This is because not every part of data is made searchable. For example, on Amazon or Target, you can search for a product's name and brand, 
but you probably cannot search for every letter and image printed on its package, or every ingredient in food or drink. These extra pieces of information may be in the database, and you may be able to see them on a product detail page, but they are not part of the search function. On the other end, when we as buyers try to browse these catalogs, we need to also transform ourselves. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say we need something to cool ourselves down, since it's summer and today is pretty hot. Um, but we cannot directly ask someone working at Amazon or Target's data center and say, hey, can you cool me down? Instead, we interact with the computer system as an intermediate and search for things in the machine's terms. That process will transform our user query, i.e., can you cool me down? to formal query, i.e. a search request that the machine can understand. So what do we do? For example, I usually just click on that search box and use a keyboard to type in short phrases, for example, fans. And once I hit search, the web browser will take the words I put in and wrap it in an HTML request. It will send it over some internet infrastructure to Amazon or Target server, and the server will unwrap that request probably taking also my user ID, location, and browsing history as well, and combine them into a query for its backend database. That database query is very, very different from human language, and is probably not very friendly for human readers. But the machine will be able to use it and draw out a list of potential products for me. In this process, we are transforming our initial needs for cooling into formal queries for the backend database, and that is what the machine can understand. It's the formal transformation of our human asks. Once we have those transformations done, the next thing is to have the system do the search and present the results. This is called partitioning, because the system will now just pick and reorder some ready-made data entries without further changing their contents. Here, Buckland and Plant gave a few more steps. The system needs to pull out a subset of data entries that it deems relevant, and then rank it according to some order before it finally presents the results to its user. These particular positioning stages are where search algorithms come in. There are many different ways to do the search, not just the Google-style search box, and in information science, we usually divide these different algorithmic techniques into two big camps, Boolean and Bayesian. What we usually call Boolean logics will tag everything clearly and search just according to the tag. So for example, if we search specifically for things with customer reviews above four stars, or if we filter out specific brands, then the system will filter its results rather rigidly according to that criteria. In some systems, you may even combine these criteria to make composite ones, like I want ceiling fans or standing fans, but not fancy fanless bladeless fans, okay? And I only want products that can deliver to me fast. These are all Boolean logics. If you have studied logics, basic programming, or discrete math, you probably have already seen this AND, OR, NOT, X, OR, blah, blah, kind of logical operations. They are all called Boolean operators, and they base on the logics that either you are part of a group or you are not part of a group. Then the operators combine the groups differently. These are also the basic logics that digital computers work on today. But Boolean operations cannot cover all the search functions that we are seeing today. When we search for products, they are usually ranked by relevance. And we also see machine recommendations like people often buy this together, or these may be alternatives to consider, or you may also like these. Also, outside of product catalogs, AI recommendations and predictions are just about everywhere. On the less prominent side, you have smartphone keyboards predicting our next words and making autocorrections. On the headlines, you also have AI systems in medical research, city planning, and in generating real-looking images and text. These kind of searches and recommendations rely on statistical possibilities and patterns, with what we call Bayesian inference, a mathematical technique to calculate the most possible results given a known condition. A naive Bayes classifier of books, for example, can look at individual words that appear in books and count how many times a book with a certain word fall into a certain category. The algorithm will take historical data of books with human assigned categories and it will find these statistical relations in there. After that, if you give the algorithm any, any new books, it can look up all the characteristic words in that book. Based on that, it will calculate which category this book most likely belongs to. 
basically mimicking historical patterns of how people have assigned the categories. This pattern finding and pattern mimicking technique is an old statistical tool, but it still serves as a very basic logic behind the most cutting edge AI system today. Compared to Boolean logics, Bayesian inference is much more flexible. But it is also very opaque, because now you can't really tell the exact logic or traits the machine is following, and as an individual, you can't really control or change it much about a pre-made algorithm, because it is trained on thousands of entries of historical data. And on the development side, making this algorithm also needs huge amounts of pre-structured data, and that is why data tagging, user data surveillance, and data scraping are new exploitative forms of internet economy. Hey, now that we know the big logical paradigms, let's look at the actual engineering of information seeking systems. This particular area of research is called information retrieval or IR. IR studies how systems retrieve information resources relevant to users' information needs. This is not just matching keywords or searching metadata. As Buckland and Plant theorize, it's about how to formalize what people want and transform the human needs into structured, systemic languages and the machine function. So on a very basic level, information retrieval, information system, and classification are kind of describing the same practices. Traditionally, information retrieval deals with text. Research works usually assume your system is like a library, an article database, a bunch of web shape pages, an email archive, etc. Very, very roughly speaking, they assume you have this limited set of articles and when a user comes in with their information need, they will find a particular set of articles that are clearly useful, while the rest of it clearly irrelevant. When the user queries the system, the system will do its best to guess what the user needs, and of course, its return results will be a mix of useful and useless entries. Based on this assumption, IR researchers can count how many red useful results the system finds, and also how many useful results it misses out. Respectively, these two aspects are measured by what we call precision and recall. And there are, of course, more complex, fancier measurements that evaluate, say, whether the most relevant entries are on the top of the result list, things like that. These measurements allow researchers to quantitatively decide how good or effective a system is. Again, this is just a very rough overview of a traditional information retrieval. Research topics in IR today not only cover information filtering, as we just discussed, but also things like document summarization, document clustering or categorization, question answering, recommending systems, and cross-language retrieval. In other words, IR covers not only classical searching, but also shortening and summarizing text, assigning subjects and categories, answering natural language questions with bots, voice assistants, and chat AIs, and recommending relevant things or things of interest, and also translating and multi-language searching. Its evaluation method also spans more than counting relevant entries, but covers small group user studies, large-scale user interaction tracking, usage data analysis, test dataset, and so on. So that is all for today. In this lesson, we review the history of classification, theories of information system structures and search algorithms, and we look at information retrieval as an engineering research field. These works examine how we as humans translate ourselves and interact with formal machine system to get what we need from other people. A lot of these works are grounded in the need to differentiate things, as I said at the very beginning of this lesson. Systems set some things and people together, and other things and people apart. It's important to know how to do this differentiating work effectively and productively, but it's also important to know why and by what standards are we differentiating. Again, information systems allow huge groups of people to work with each other, and they make the world run. But we also need to catch what and who are falling through the system, what and who the systems are failing, because that is where we need to work on. In the next lesson, we will take a more substantial step into critical works. We will discuss social, political, and historical studies of technology, and we will have a clearer picture of how to examine and evaluate the good, bad, and ugly of information systems. 
So that is it for this lesson, and I will see you next time. Till then, stay informed, stay well. Peace. So here's an example. Library is very well. If you ever want to change anything, ka ka ka.